Good evening, everybody. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, and I want to welcome you to this, the final lecture in the OHC's public lecture series in Eugene on this year's theme, We the People. At a time of deep division, disagreement, and unrest across our nation and the globe, a time that confronts us with a host of urgent and unprecedented challenges, we at the OHC selected a theme that would invite our lecturers to reflect from their various perspectives on the capacious and inclusive phrase, we the people. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, however, I just have to do um, a couple of uh, my obligatory announcements. First, uh, as you came in, you saw our information table in the lobby where you can find out about the Oregon Humanities Center and our events and programs, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Uh, our speaker has generously agreed to do about 15 minutes of Q&A after the talk and then a book signing in the lobby. Uh, when we do the Q&A, uh, please come to the microphones, speak into the microphones so that everyone can hear you. We are recording uh, the, the lecture, uh, so it's important that people hear your questions. Um, to maximize audience opportunities to ask questions, please make sure to keep your questions as concise as possible. Uh, next, I need to give my usual thanks. First, many thanks to our collaborators in EMU Event Services and at the Center for Media and Educational Technologies for their logistical and technical support. Special thanks, as always, to the OHC's crack staff, Julia Hayden, Gina Turner, Melissa Gustafson, Gustafson Peg Gerhardt, and Greta Blankenship. And last but not least, thanks to our generous donors and patrons for their support. If you want to join them in supporting cutting edge research and uh, uh, public programs in the humanities like this one, please pick up uh, a donation envelope uh, on your way out. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker, award-winning writer and critic Margot Jefferson, who will deliver the Criticos Lecture in the Humanities. We're especially pleased to be able to welcome Margot Jefferson to Oregon after having had to cancel her visit planned for last May. Established in 1993 through a generous gift from two of the OHC's loyal Portland patrons, the Criticos Professorship brings to the university and the state of Oregon distinguished scholars, critics, and leaders in the humanities. From the Greek, Criticos translates roughly as able to judge, evaluate, and criticize. As the term suggests, the Criticos Professorship was created to foster the education of UO students and faculty and to promote intelligent, critical public discussion across the state. Criticos professors are known for speaking their minds, even if what they have to say is provocative or unfashionable. As one of our most penetrating, articulate, and distinctive critics on culture, gender, class, and race, Margot Jefferson is an ideal Criticos professor, well-suited to address our theme of We the People. In all her writing, whether cultural criticism, biography, or memoir, Margot Jefferson combines a capacious historical consciousness, an acute critical judgment, a style at once graceful and bracing, and a conviction in the power of the arts and the humanities to illuminate even the most complex and thorny issues, issues and help guide us to better and more humane understandings of those issues and ourselves. Margot Jefferson is a Pulitzer Prize winning cultural critic. She's been a staff writer for the New York Times and Newsweek. Her reviews and essays have appeared in New York Magazine, Grand Street, Vogue, Harper's, and many other publications. Jefferson's monograph on Michael Jackson was published in 2006 and it's just been reprinted and, uh, in the UK by Granta Press. She's received a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Rockefeller Foundation Theater Communications Group grant. She's also written and performed two theater pieces at the Cherry Lane Theater and the Cultural Project, the Culture Project. Her 2015 book, The Memoir Negro Land, received the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, the Heartland Prize for Nonfiction, the Bridge Prize for Nonfiction, and was shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize. Tonight, Margot Jefferson brings her incomparable critical acumen and insights to the topic of from I 
to we, the role of the citizen critic. Please join me in welcoming Margot Jefferson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Where did he go? He disappeared. Oh, there you are. Yes. Um, um, and um, just a special thanks to the Oregon Humanities Center. Everyone has been just wonderful. Um, so um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's an honor, in fact, to be here, um, particularly since I couldn't come last year, um, giving the final Criticos lecture in the University of Oregon here at Eugene's We the People series. So I thank the Oregon Humanities Center and the university for inviting me. What, what ominous um, and often ugly times we live in. Um, for decades now, whenever the political and cultural landscape has looked ominous, writers, scholars, and even literate politicians have quoted those famous lines by the Irish poet William Butler Yeats. I'm sure there are people in this room who could quote them with me. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. They're still stirring words, and they are still true. The worst are full of passionate intensity. Um, but also of the cheapest, meanest citizen, it's cynicism. And I see all kinds of evidence that the good and the best among us are full of resourceful conviction and passionate intensity. Um, I've called my talk from I to we, the role of the citizen critic, and I in fact should have said the roles, because we all live out, negotiate multiple roles, shaped by our family histories, social histories, biological and intellectual histories, beliefs, principles, passions, parent, child, partner, single, married, pre-war, which war, post-war, millennial, Gen X, in good health or in ill health. You'll notice I haven't yet mentioned race and ethnicity, class, gender, or religion. That was deliberate. I wanted us all to remember, first, some of these particulars that shape the more contentious categories and identities, the ones we fight about in public. The we's and they's at the core of so many fractures and struggles in our so-called United States. Fractures over what these categories mean, struggles for justice for all in these categories, for protection under all the laws that are supposed to constitute a democracy, not a plutocracy, with autocratic ambitions. All of these struggles are grounded in action, but they're just as grounded in language. Language as intellectual and emotional anguish. Action, God, I almost said anguish, that's interesting. <laughs> as an instrument of cultural and political action, as a vehicle for clarity and accuracy, not obfuscation or propaganda, for eloquence and not showboat viciousness. I'm a writer, so I live by and through language. It's my passion and my job to ask how we find words that animate and honor the varied truths of our lives. Language that helps us trust contradictions and test certainties, probe our own irrationalities, question the boundaries of our experience. I want to examine these questions through the lens of my experiences as a citizen, as a critic, and as a memoirist. First, me, a citizen. I'm a citizen of the United States and a citizen of the world. In its original Western meaning, a citizen was a person who shared a space with others, shared in a community, bound by certain values and interests, certain dreams, not by exclusionary laws. When I say the world, I mean both the natural world and the human-made world with its multiple nations and societies. And tonight, I want to emphasize within the human world, the world of intellectuals and artists and the works they make to stimulate our minds and imaginations, to re-envision cultures and communities, 
And I want to emphasize the world of their readers and viewers and listeners, people who love thinking and feeling strongly about the stuff of the world, history, politics, art, science, people who create their own curricula every day for the challenge of it and for the fun of it. As citizens of the world, we're divided by many things, but we are joined willy-nilly by communication, technological, personal, mass, niche. We're exposed to each other constantly. The frivolous and the cataclysmic are images and headlines away. We need ways to give sense and shape to this material, bear witness, and take responsibility. To move outside what we know we know, the philosopher and commentator Anthony Appiah calls this cosmopolitanism. Very suave, nice word. Inquiry and argument are crucial to cosmopolitanism. Inquiry, or call it curiosity, as the will to ask, the desire to learn. Argument as informed talk, mutual examining, even when it makes us very uncomfortable. Conversation and exchange of ideas and feelings, dissent and assent, a questioning of yourself as well as the subject and the people you're conversing with. An example, let's consider two ways of talking about citizenship by two well-known um, writers, one a politician, one um, an artist activist. And let's see how these seemingly very different ways might speak to one another. In his 1960 inaugural address, President John F. Kennedy famously urged Americans to ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. In her 2014 book, Citizen, poet and essayist Claudia Rankin shows and tells what white America has done um, to wrong its black citizens. She does this in language that mediates and soars taking on the voices and thoughts of many citizens. So how does one construct a useful relationship between Kennedy and Rankin? Here's a beginning. We ask what our country should do for us all and what we can do to hold it to its highest values and ideals. We probe the ways in which our country fails some of its citizens. And we seek ways inside ourselves and in the world to acknowledge and redeem these failures. We, do, we and our country do this for each other. Now, the citizen critic. Um, I'm calling myself a citizen critic because I admire the fact that so many artists today crowd, proudly call themselves citizen artists. Citizen artists reject the long-standing idea that there is, there must, that there is perhaps for the best artist, a sacred division between aesthetics and social consciousness. Citizen critics work to see that all people have equal um, and fair access to the arts. No aspect of life is alien to citizen artists. They make their art in and for schools, hospitals, prisons, community centers, parks, in neighborhoods long neglected by more official arts institutions. The Aspen Institute's program for citizen artists, in fact, invokes the UN's 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights to challenge citizen artists to be part of a global creative coalition that works to see all people are given access to art's transformative powers. As a citizen critic, I want to write and talk in ways that further this visionary coalition. But more specifically, I want to write and talk in ways that further intellectual and emotional exploration, that spur people to take pleasure, to be excited by thinking and feeling. And this is crucial for a critic, ways that make asking questions as useful and as gratifying as pronouncing judgments. Now, me, the critic. We critics, arts and culture critics, social critics, we live by argument and strongly worded opinions. We live by judgments. We live by emotions that can lie almost too deep for words. 
but we must keep looking for the words, for language that moves you, that asks you to respond with us, yes, but also beyond us and against us, to engage with people around you, other readers, listeners, as they do the same, to create a polyphonic conversation. We are very lucky, we critics, to do for a living what we would do for pleasure anyway. It's true. If we're arts critics like me, we read books, go to plays, concerts, movies, listen to music, watch new cable series, lots of new cable series. <laughs> But as people say about relationships, this does take work. <laughs> Commitment. We think about the culture at large, its controversies, its trends, the ideas and desires that power it. We think about aesthetics, history, sociology. We study to keep up, and sometimes we have to cram, just like in those old finals days. We try to be students and teachers at the same time, what don't we know enough about? We have to ask that. Why do we have such an intense, irrational dislike of a certain kind of art? We do ask ourselves that. How do we critique ourselves, our tastes and assumptions, along with the book, the movie, the play, the emerging new, new star? Critics are often called judges. They're traditionally called judges, which suggests that we have omniscient power and objectivity. Um, I emphatically don't believe this. We all, you too, know better now than to accept the critical and journalistic myths of total objectivity. Now, I do not believe in total objectivity, but I do believe in what I call hard-won fairness. We do our research thoroughly, and we make sure we're not just consulting for sources that feed our biases and make us feel good about them. We make sure that uh, we listen to the criticism of our audience. Those letters and emails can be painful to read, but they're worth listening to, and our peers. Um, I've often found it so interesting to test um, a book I'm reading, a play I'm going to, something against the feelings of a really intelligent friend of mine who is not in the arts, you know, a lawyer, a historian, something like that. Um, Something else always happens. Um, I also don't believe in the long-cherished idea of immutable artistic canons, the great works, ideas, and artists that are beyond being questioned, replaced, or added to. Um, I do I'm, believe in canons, but they and the people who make them have to be flexible and ever willing to revise the relations between our cultural past and present. Ideally, we critics question our own work as thoroughly as we question the work we're writing about, from the ideas to just words, sentences, phrases that we start using as obsessively as, you know, sitcom actors will play off the same little gestures and ticks all the time. We also do something more primal, more instinctual. At the same time we're being rational, showing off our rationality, we try to recreate the experience of seeing, hearing, viewing the work of art, the sensations, the pleasures of a piece of choreography, a, a fabulous old movie, a glorious new song, or just a good new song. We try to describe and relive what we experience so that our readers can live or relive this same material through their senses. We join that sensory material, these affects, to our thoughts, our analysis. And that analysis is not a hard and fast ruling. It's a work in progress. It's crucial that we give the readers room to be independent. Because like them, we're audience members. Critics are fans, skeptics, excited consumers, mad to be thrilled or at least stimulated. Experiencing what makes a piece of art seem beautiful or ugly is so interesting. Asking what we mean by beautiful or ugly, agog and confounded by our feverish culture of controversies, obsessions, ideologies, and desires. And now the memoirist in me will step forward. 
Um, I've been an arts and culture critic since the early 1970s. I've written for large mainstream periodicals, uh, smaller alternative periodicals, for women's magazines, for black magazines, for largely white periodicals with black, Latinx, Asian, Native American, and other non-white readers, for largely heterosexual publications with LGBTQ readers. You'll notice that my phrases and clauses get more and more specific. And that reflects the points of view that form my experiences as a critic. In several ways, the early 70s were a very good time to enter the world of criticism. Thanks to the pressure of civil rights and feminism, journalism was opening up to people like me, to women and minorities in an absolutely new way. And in general, culture was on the move. Relations between high and popular culture were flipping and shifting. Critics were taking up subjects that had once been dismissed as beneath serious critical consideration. My first full-time job was at Newsweek magazine. As some of you know, others of you may never have even heard of it. Newsweek no longer exists. <laughs> at that time, it was the rival, the mirror, if you will, of time, which is probably why it no longer exists. I was hired as a book critic who wrote about movies and popular music from time to time. So I had a beat, as we called it. But it wasn't that simple. I was a critic. I was also a cluster of adjectives and nouns that carried weighted social and political meanings from the traditionally prescriptive to the newly exhilarating. I was a black critic. I was a woman critic. Often, depending on the setting, I was the first black, the first woman, and or the first black woman critic at fill in the blank. <laughs> These facts affected what I chose to write and how others chose to read me. They offered possibilities. They imposed pressures that were external and internal. They definitely gave me freedom to write and think past the old canons. I was a progressive black feminist, and I wanted to write about books that my white male colleagues rarely, if ever, did. Books by blacks and by other writers of color around the globe. Books by women of all colors. And at the same time, I wanted to write about any book by any white man, living or dead, that interested me. Any aspect of history or culture from any part of the world that interested me. You see, when I graduated from college in 1968, black studies, ethnic studies, women's studies, gay studies were just starting to be taught in universities. Um, for that matter, film studies were just starting to be taught. My fervent reading of the growing body of scholarship and literature in these areas was my young adult, well, my adult education, done in those years with my friends and colleagues as these movements flourished filled with revelations, with activism, and with art. In grammar school, high school, and for most of college, I had been a student of literature and history written almost entirely by white men. So I learned, I had to learn, to imagine, to study, to dream, and to write about worlds that had never imagined me. Or when they did, they imagined me as a footnote, a symbol, a bit player, an object of fear or lust, disdain or loathing. That was hard and that was painful. Nevertheless, when I look back and try to analyze all the ways it affected me, I find two, two benefits. It showed me, one, that my brain and imagination could roam any territory with authority, with personal authority. And it showed me that there is power, even pleasure, in learning to imagine what has not and cannot imagine you. It is a hard-won skill and an honorable one. And it is a rewarding one as long as you also acquire and possess the tools to fully imagine your own worlds and yourselves. So what did this mean in my everyday life as a young critic? It meant that when I began to write, I was not going to give away or trade away anything I learned to like or love if I could help it. Any part of what was my historical, um, my sociological, 
and my personal culture. I was going to live as a critic in multiple worlds. I was going to bring these worlds into conversation with each other. Well, exactly 20 years and many articles from many publications um, after my first job at Newsweek, I joined the staff of the New York Times. I began as a book critic, then lobbied to become a theater critic, and then a critic at large, as it was called, a roaming observer of this churning spectacle of American and world culture. Um, I wanted my writing to stimulate and give pleasure. Pleasure through my words, stimulation through my thoughts. To keep people caring about individual works of arts and entertainment. And to ask more questions. Um, fewer answers, more questions about culture. I wanted to challenge myself and push beyond the answers that I was sure of. Push beyond the little stylistic devices I was handy with. What were my prejudices? What were likes and dislikes I couldn't justify with a, a deft intellectual argument? And how could I air those in a piece? How do you find um, authority? Because every critic has to have some version of authority through questions, through ambivalence, through kinds of vulnerability. Um, I wanted to be a citizen of the culture in conversation with it and with other reader citizens. Uh, for many decades, journalists in mainstream publications like The Times or Newsweek, many others, were forbidden to or discouraged from using the first person pronoun, the dread I. I mean, it was literally forbidden, um, even for critics. Instead of I, critics tended to use that first person plural even when we were pronouncing a very firm personal judgment. We find objectionable Mr. So-and-so's. We've rarely seen such brilliance. We wonder if the artist was fully aware of that. <laughs> that we meant that our readers were our students and our followers. That we also presumed that all of those theys were very much like us and ever eager to accept our views. It implied we were omniscient narrators, leading them towards the best, the wisest, the most educated conclusions. We is a complicated pronoun. Take that famous phrase from our constitutional preamble, we the people. It's a declaration, a definition, an affirmation, but it's a provocation too. It provokes each of us as individuals as eyes who cherish our particular identities, who want to protect them. It in provokes us to think about how these identities might join forces in the community. And by forces, I mean beliefs, achievements, and dreams, but also uncertainties and conflicts, histories and traditions that often clash. We, the people, are communities and cultures struggling hard to make sense of one another. What kind of we or what kind of we's are worth dreaming of and working for? As an arts and culture critic, I speak to a lot of I's and we's, they's too. I've always been astonished when um, writers are able to kind of gracefully describe the reader they write for, because I've always had a sense that I'm writing for all kinds of people and to all kinds of people who may have nothing in common with each other on occasion or who may just suddenly pull up short and um, pull back from each other. We critics do love being listened to. This is one thing we all share. Um, we also share this with those we call pundits and columnists. Vanity is an occupational hazard for us all. And it can become a form of hubris when we're unwilling to rethink or question ourselves. Every bit as wrong, as unacceptable as a reporter unwilling to accept or record information that alters the story he or she expected to get. Toni Morrison writes, quote, the resources available to us for benign access to each other for vaulting the mere blue air that separates us are few, language, image, and experience. 
Language, she says, can give us the desire and the will to breach the distances among us, quote, whether they are continental or on the same pillow, whether they are distances of culture or gender, whether they are the consequences of social invention or biology. By contrast, Morrison goes on to say images, so dominant in social media, in our culture at large, hit us so, so quickly and so viscerally that they short circuit or can short circuit inquiry and knowledge. Quote, an image can determine not only what we know and feel, but what we believe is worth knowing about what we feel. Now, I want to pause on that because careless or arrogant criticism can do exactly what Morrison charges the image with doing. Go to your periodicals, not just you know, online blogs and publications, even go to the old style um, periodicals, and you'll feel that instantly. Not always, but often. Criticism, and I include ed editorials, can turn us all into, into rhetorical tyrants. You've all heard and read words like these. If you haven't, good for you. Um, but words like these, anyone who admires the work of an artist like X should be banned for life from the theater, from the museum. Um, X's writing is so awful it makes one think that a book burning need I'd always be a crime. Yeah. Yeah. So jaunty, so pleased, um, so high-handed. Um, and you know, I didn't discover until um, I published books myself and began to read some of the negative reviews that karma comes back to you. <laughs> you know, because I could see at moments these same kind of grand and grandiose um, you know, rhetorical cruelties um, lobbed back at, at me. Um, anyway, um, arts and culture writing can be as rife with small-minded, self-serving judgments as any political and legal system, as any of ours. New ideas, new experiences demand our attention all the time. No critic, no citizen can afford to be a lofty eye anymore presiding with utter confidence over the subject. There are too many subjects colliding and collaborating. There are too many eyes, not just around us, but inside each of us. Too many we's. Um, I want to end by reading a piece from um, my memoir, Negro Land, that I wrote when I first realized that I wanted to join in this memoir, the literary, um, the personal, and the political, that I wanted it to be part criticism, part confession, part question, part analysis. And it's very much about the I's and the we's that um, are shaped um, in us by culture and by history. Um, it is set, you should know, in the um, early 60s, um, 1961 two, to be exact. And it's set at my high school in Chicago. We, the students of Audrey Borth's sophomore English class, are being ardently well-educated, studying great and good British and American writers, being readied for initiation into an adult we of critics, scholars, and uncommon common readers. This year, we will read essays, calmly yet challenging essays, by E.M. Forster, George Orwell, and James Baldwin. A smaller we, Baldwin and I, have privileged relations. We are both Negroes. We are both intellectual. He is a serious, famous artist. I long to be seriously artistic and famous. I am at an advantage in this class, as I was not when we read Mark Twain as freshmen. My mother has stocked our library with classics. I read Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn in childhood, moved listlessly on to Kidnapped in Treasure Island, then left them unfinished to the older sister who proclaimed herself the hero of every adventure and doubled as the smarter villains, too. I was a jealous little she-reader. I resented pouring myself into the lives of hero boys. I did my duty in the classroom. I was a good student but Huck Finn was not of my ilk. 
cheeky, scene-stealing, southern, white trash, antebellum boy. And what was to be done with Nigger Jim, that man by stealth slave, discharging his duties as boy playmate? He was an object lesson in slavery's wrong. How could he be an imaginary companion for me, daughter of we, the Negro elite, who never stopped asking aggrieved rhetorical questions like, why is it always the nigger Jims who show up in Mark Twain's fiction? Why couldn't he base a character on Warner Thornton McGuinn, the first Negro graduate of Yale Law School? <laughs> Twain actually met McGuinn and was so impressed he offered him financial aid the same year he published Huckleberry Finn, but he never made it into a novel. We are not what they want to see in their books and movies. Our we is too much like theirs which threatens them, bores them, or both. But now here we are, black and white students both, reading the Negro James Baldwin. And here I am at home, upstairs by myself, reading him and preparing for class. What do my white friends think as they read? What will we say in class tomorrow? And what measure of engaged detachment will I bring to our and their discussion? I pick up the book and turn to the assigned essay, Notes of a Native Son, by James Baldwin, Many Thousands Gone. The next words are Baldwin's. The story of the Negro in America is the story of America, or more precisely, it is the story of Americans. It is not a very pretty story. The story of a people is never very pretty. The Negro in America, gloomily referred to as that shadow which lies athwart our national life, is far more than that. He is a series of shadows, self-created, intertwining, which now we helplessly battle. Who is this we of Baldwin's? It's you, white readers. But what of we, his smaller band of Negro readers, his Negro in America is the Negro that so many Negroes like me dread having plural relations with. One may say that the Negro in America does not really exist except in the darkness of our minds. One, a pronoun even more adroitly insidious than we. An I made ubiquitous, our. Our minds, our, say it slowly, voluptuously. Baldwin has coupled and merged us in syntactical miscegenation. We Negro readers will pause here and arrange ourselves in attitudes of easy triumph. We are throwing off that helplessly which Baldwin initially placed on us. We are anything but helpless now as he unfurls clauses, vaults across semicolons, submits ignorance to rigor and unreason to stringent passion. Close the book. Breathe deeply. James Baldwin is proclaiming right of entry with every possessive pronoun, integrating America by means of grammar and syntax. No demonstrators hosed into the air and crashing onto pavements. No tear-gassed bodies coughing and twisting. No children your age dressed in exhaustively clean pressed clothes to walk shielded by armed guards into schools built to deny them. Baldwin. The ways in which the Negro has affected the American psychology are betrayed in our popular culture and in our morality. In our estrangement from him is the depth of our estrangement from ourselves. The Negro Baldwin has inserted himself into your life, white reader. This hour claims all you possess. You thought you were just reading him. No, you are living with him and all of his relatives now. And if you flee, you will find yourself resettled on a despoiled patch of psychic land where you will live in severely reduced circumstances. You will be estranged from the only you worth having. You will have no privileges my we is bound to respect. I can't sit still anymore. I move from my desk to the couch in the next room. But curling up on pillows feels childish. I need to be upright and vigilant as I read. I go back to my desk. Baldwin. We cannot ask what do we really feel about him. 
What we really feel about him is involved with all that we feel about ourselves. And it's a good thing I'm upright and at the ready as I read. I know all too well what we think of this potent, deviant Negro. He threatens the achievements of my Negroes each time we make another dignified incursion into American life. I want to renounce that shame and contempt now. Join Baldwin to construct a complex, compound Negro we. When I reach the essay's end, I feel adventuresome and daring. He is so proud yet vulnerable, so full of longing and righteous hauteur. He has what I want, and I read on. Follow as he summers in an obscure Swiss village. This world is white no longer, and it will never be white again. Scores his own American in Paris, orchestrating Africans, Algerian, and Frenchmen in counterpoint. Makes his father a Lear on Harlem's heath, himself the Edgar who lives to take the measure of a changed world. Finally, I approach the shabby, unhallowed ground of the first essay, everybody's protest novel. That's what Baldwin calls it, and everybody is anybody who has ever written a socially conscious book maimed by, his words, shrill outbursts and thin exhortations. The mother of this unseemly brood is Harriet Beecher Stowe. I haven't read the lady, and I don't need to. Everybody's educated Negro has been sick and tired of her book since the final years of the preceding century. I settle myself on Baldwin's arm, and we sally forth. Together, we execute a gleeful double cabriole, as he writes. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a very bad novel, having in its self-righteous, virtuous sentimentality. I fumble. Falter, I can see the words that follow. I straighten up, try to match his gait once more. Having in its self-righteous, virtuous sentimentality, I stutter a step, for here comes the damning conclusion. Having in its self-righteous, virtuous sentimentality much in common with little women. Oh no. Not that. <laughs> Must I throw off the little women of my girlhood? <laughs> the little women of we too, my sister and me, with our petticoats and patent leather shoes, our music and dance lessons, our diaries, our parties, our unceasing instruction in manners and morals. Girls whose utterly benign father is often away from home doing good for his people. Captain March. Dr. Jefferson, girls whose marmy, our mother, pours and settles herself into every space of our being. Baldwin's scorn is majestic. Sentimentalists like Louisa May Alcott do not truly feel, he scoffs. They play at feeling with flattering outbursts. If you give, forgive me, with fluttering outbursts that show just how much they fear the stuff of real life, real experience. In the end, he doesn't even condescend to give them their own pronoun. In the end, the only sentimentalist truly worth his scorn is the one who exposes his fear of death, his arid heart. Silly lady novelists, silly girl readers. My future beckons. I can renounce all shallow girl tastes, striving ceaselessly to be a Negro intellectual like Baldwin, as good as or better than any white he. Or I can become an exemplary teacher and mother, one who will pass her love of literature, serious and sentimental, on to the children in her care. I close the book, go to the couch, and lie down. Thank you.
Uh, yes, all right. So thank you so much for coming. Um, My pleasure. Most of us in the room probably don't have a, a national periodical at our disposal to voice our social criticism. Uh, and it seems like so much of the uh, dialogue going on right now in the country is, is handled in uh, you know, 140 characters at a time. Uh, I think we all, to use your words, uh, imagine ourselves architects of deft intellectual arguments. Uh, but how do we uh, voice that in the, the mode of communication right now without um, falling prey to uh, the cheap cynicism that you alluded to earlier? Well, um, you're, you're speaking of, say, yourself as a professional writer or not as a professional writer? I am definitely not a professional writer. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm speaking of myself as a citizen. Yes, okay, okay. Um, for one thing, um, there are always letters to editors. Um, and they, those are some of the most interesting editorial pages um, in newspapers. Um, there are many people I know of many ages, though I'm, I'm told people um, that Gen X doesn't, doesn't care about blogging anymore, many people blog because that genuinely is a way to um, express at leisure and with consideration um, opinions. Um, there are certain online, you know, kind of longer form prose um, sites, nonfiction prose sites where you can, you know, with platforms where you can in fact post sustained and longer pieces. Um, you know, tweets, um, I, I was very dismissive of tweets when they first emerged, but um, I have friends who send really good ones to me. There is a kind of art form to it. Tweet can function like an epigram, you know, um, or a really, really, um, certain one-liners have a wisdom to them. I was talking earlier tonight about um, some of Dorothy Parker's great one-liners. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't dismiss those, um, dismiss those, those forms, even, you know, if you're following, um, you know, a link, even on YouTube, you can find a surprising amount of intelligent commentary, say, on a piece of music. But I would say it is true, you want to, you want to take, you want to take more time with people, um, you know, it, with talking with people. So I would say these, you know, Platforms where min number of voices can exchange um, opinions, but also again, I'd say I'd say blog. I'd say form a book or an arts club, um, and really, you know, make that conversation um, crucial. Or it's you know, I know people who have book or arts clubs, and one member is responsible for bringing a short paper or reading a short paper to it every week. Now, I grant you, you're going to be talking to an audience of the converted. You're not going to invite your enemies <laughs> into, your, into your arts club. So the citizen in you had probably better be going to town meetings also, you know, and really practicing. Um, I, again, I have friends who've become um, active in <gasps> local politics since Trump. And, you know, it's not only a way to be active in local politics, it's a way of practicing your conversational and debating and collaborative verbal um, and action skills. Internet uh, participant, another question similar. Uh, just as uh, institutions of mass culture have reflected the culture and also guided it over past yeah. generations, and so have individual authors and players, just as you uh, described. So I see them as like the predecessors of us on the uh, on Facebook and social media. I, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. You know, particularly when you think about um, old, you know, um, our, um, entertainment magazines like you know Variety and things like you know, boom, boom, or Billboard. These little uh, the the their descendants are people in Entertainment Weekly. You know, snap, bang, absolutely. So so here's the question. Uh, the, the direction that culture takes in our beliefs and our values has consequences, and it isn't neutral. So my question is, uh, do you think that the uh, nature of internet communication and shorter format will uh, simply accelerate the movement of culture, or do you think that it will have results in one, some direction or another? Do you, do you see it, how do you see it changing the country? That, that's really Well, I guess what we should be asking ourselves, you too, don't leave now, <laughs> uh, is, is, 
how has it already changed the country? I mean, what are you seeing that has already, that internet culture has already changed? Oh. Well, I see it, uh, I see it accelerating the direction of culture because the speed we that can which, more, yes. more quickly yeah. swat down uh, just untruths and omissions are very quickly filled. But I'm really not so sure, uh, and I'm not really an optimist that accelerating the direction of culture is going to get us to a, a better place or, or a worse place, you know. S I, um, I know. It does feel as if our, our brains really have to, like, accelerate and develop, like we have to, like, fine tool, as if, as, if, as if we were developing our own cells at the same time we're trying to develop robots, you know, to take it all in and filter it and shift it and, and, and you know. Well, um, the danger I see, like, with my two sons who are just getting me. out of college, it's moved to such short and telegraphic communication that really what they're really doing is pointing to some symbol or some cluster of thought that they presume the other person exists in their mind and that um, is the same as what they're pointing to. So there's really a danger that uh, they really aren't pointing to the same thing at all. And so there may be a false sense of... Uh, you mean they're uh, almost talking in code. Yeah, that's very yeah. short uh, telegraphic. Yeah. So that's the, the danger I see is that uh, there might actually be a... You know, I don't want to say that we're going to have to uh, recapitulate and, move, uh, and start with coarseness and, and, uh, and poor, poorly thought out uh, culture, you know. But uh, that's what it looks like to me. We're going to take a step back and then we'll have, you know, 50 years from now we'll have a better thing. That's what I think is well, going to happen. But, you know, it does seem to me that if we're, we're talking about the general education um, level in culture, I mean, this is not just social media. You know, the American public school system has been disintegrating and has been gutted in many ways for years. So you have some generations of people who have very little to do with social media who, you know, know very little. They're not taught civics. They're not, you know, who... It, so, so this, is, this is not a problem just of social media. It, what is true is that more of these voices can, like, explode onto social media and get a, and get a little hearing. Um, but the, the problems are running, it seems to me, deeper than that. Also, I am surprised at how much interesting stuff shows up on, on social media, too. You know, and also how much of it can make me feel a little dumb because you know, they, they have the, uh, um, their, own, their own resources. There are ways of combining words and images that to me seem very interesting and provocative. But yeah, um, these are huge questions that um, it's hard to have answers to. We're all living through it and at the mercy of it to some extent. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> When I first saw the title of your talk, uh, From I to We, another phrase that I heard recently came to mind, uh, we, not me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my thought on that ultimately was perhaps it should be uh, we and I. And I'm wondering if there's some direction beyond that dichotomy that we should be going towards. Well, I, I was hoping that the, uh, you know, if, I'm, if we're going from an, Okay, so instead of thinking from I to we, you're saying it's I and we. So that there is or constantly I, that dialogue between or, the two. Or I to we and we to I. I um, that's actually what I was hoping to get at when I talked about all the different identities, all the I's and the we's inside us. Um, we can never get rid of the I's. We, we cherish the notion. Um, I think this is one reason that memoirs are very popular now. Um, you know, we cherish this, this idea of a kind of sacred personal self that um, developed, shaped by, but also in, in, in often in opposition to those people we love best. Um, you know, our parents, our family members, schools. Um, you know, we, we, that indivisible, you know, self that's in a that's that's in a poem or or a theatrical monologue or a soliloquy. We'll we'll never get rid of that, but um, it coexists with you know all. First of all, it's made by so many other forces. Our 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 sense that this this self is this personal creation is is a little overly romantic. It's not only, it's not just a personal creation, you know, at, at, at all. 
Um, but um, yeah, so I would say it's, you know, the old, there's the old F. Scott Fitzgerald line, um, the test of a truly first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two totally opposed ideas in your head at the same time and continue to function. Um, that's in a way what you say, yes. the I and the we. Um, and um, these days, in fact, we've got to multitask more. Um, you know, in Fitzgerald's time, holding two opposed ideas was good enough. Now we've got eyes, we's, they's. Um, you know, and again, I'd say there's more than one I inside each of us. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so Dr. Harry Edwards was here a, a couple of days ago, and I just can't help but thinking that um, you two were starting your careers in a similar time, focusing on uh, different aspects of culture. Um, as a arts and culture critic, I was wondering if you had, and I know this is vague, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but any critiques of the Me Too movement while we're talking about we? Wow. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, yeah, just picturing the, the me too that is an implied, I thought I, well, that is a clear, I thought it was just me, but the two means, you know, it's we. Um, so wait, you want me to have criticisms of it? Was that what you were saying? Whatever you feel comfortable with being put on the spot. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I was thrilled, and I am still very galvanized um, by, um, the facts of and the possibilities of Me Too and Time's Up. Um, I am, you know, at, at first, at first it was functioning as like some, you know, mass um, psychological, sexual, gender journalistic expose. I mean, it was, you know, it was like this total, 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 um, you know, expose writ large. Um, and it was really a groundswell. I was, I am thrilled that they moved from without, you know, saying, oh, now Hollywood stars don't matter, it's only working women, but they moved out as very quickly and really started thinking about working class women, you know, women in factories, sexual harassment, you know, as functioning on every, every, every um, economic um, level. Um, so, you know, I think it has enormous possibilities um, and already has achieved um, remarkable things. Um, I, um, I know there are a lot of debates now about, um, well, when is it, you know, Morgan Freeman recently, the, you know, what my, my body of work is, is being threatened. Um, Charlie Rose, same thing. Um, those debates are just going to unfold as like the trial of Harvey Weinstein. Um, and as long as we keep moving forward and arguing, talking, and getting the criminals, um, we'll, be, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Um, you know, just keep going with it for now. And, and forever, you know, but it's going to, it's going to keep evolving. Um, you know, and, and just as Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street. Um, have evolved, and I want it to be as varied um, and comprehensive as possible, you know, in terms of alliances and allegiances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, appreciate your talk. Trying to get my mind really wrapped around this idea of uh, citizen critic, and uh, so I'm wondering, within the context of, say, our uh, democracy, form of democracy, where some people call it advanced citizenship. I'm wondering if you could distinguish or differentiate the idea of just a citizen versus the citizen critic, where the concept of trying to get to the truth. Wait, just a citizen versus citizen critic? Yes. Well, you know. And, and on top of that, if uh, in terms of developing skills, if you could uh, recommend anything in terms of how to improve as a citizen as well as a citizen critic. Well, what we all need to do as citizens is um, basically what we've been taught to do as, um, to some extent, as students, as scholars, as critics, you know, learn, <laughs> really um, learn, take in, study um, the, the material of 
our government, our country, of politics, of economic, of social structures, um, prejudices, um, discriminations, oppressions, advances. You know, we need to really become, um, um, you know, expert. Uh, so, expert, stu expert student teachers um, of our political system, um, which, you know, like I said, intellectuals and critics take great pride in doing this um, all the time. Now, um, what criticism, it seems to me, um, you know, can, can contribute is a sense of, all, of finding finding pleasure and excitement um, and drama even in pushing your mind and, and your emotions you know, where they're not always willing to go. Um, as simple as it sounds, if you're reading a new book, um, you're testing yourself in a way, aren't you? You know, um, how is your mind working? How are you taking in the ideas? How's the language making you feel? Um, and to be willing always to do that with the experience and to be willing to be at the mercy of something or to, to, and then having to do it again. Okay, I don't get that. You know, I don't get what this um, painter is saying. I gotta go back. I got to think about it more. I got to take. I got to take notes. Um, that kind of combination of of stubborn diligence um, combined, hopefully, with a kind of humility. Um, you know that I think is 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 genuinely useful, and always the desire to 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 learn something, to to take hold of the material and work with it, and and do something with it. You know the material of 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 our nation, of our citizenship, as well as um, our field, you know, our discipline. Um. Since no one else is gonna oh, grab maybe a follow-up, but um, so I'm wondering, is there danger of having too many citizen critics, or could you say that oh, this would be- Oh, we're all citizen critics these days. So, Look, so we, maybe that would be <laughs> an Roseanne idea. Roseanne thinks she's right. a citizen critic. <laughs> 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 So it, it, I'm saying it would be good for us to be good citizens, so maybe it's an ideal that we all become effective citizen critics. And, and, yeah, and, but, and but, again, uh, bearing in mind, which, which I was kind of trying to get at, that, you know, that it, the, the arrogance, the pomposity, um, the grandiosity, that um, certainly my profession, you know, be you an arts critic or a pundit can bestow, um, you know, no. Um, that, that we have to work against all the time. And in politics, that can take the form, even when you know, your, your cause, your beliefs are wonderfully just, it can still be um, a certain kind of um, arrogance um, and exclusionary um, set of exclusionary practices that, are, that have to be worked through and passed. Please join me in thanking, thanking all of you. Was there somebody up there who had a... So there's a book signing. Uh, oh, did this one person have a... Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Just a quick question. Sure. She, uh, you, in the aisle, I couldn't... No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm fairly confident in my writing and... I participate in a activist organization here. It's a local activist um, um, about education. Um, I take advantage of writing letters to editors. Um, beyond that, I really have a hard time finding ways to participate and to engage in policy debate and to especially engage people who I don't necessarily agree with. And um, I'm just wondering if you can speak to, you mentioned earlier in your talk tonight, and I didn't quite catch what that was, uh, groups of people who get together and talk about analyzing the current events. Well, I, I actually was saying to um, a man over there, I certainly know people who belong it, you know, it's a variant of the of the book club, but it could be a political 
um, a political affairs club. Um, you know, it could be an arts and culture club. Uh, but you know, it depends what kind of work you want to get involved with. It sounds as if you're doing you're doing fine now. Well, it, I wonder if it's enough because everything seems so urgent. The, That's a good deal. You know, I agree with you is, there. Yeah, that uh, you know, it, it's really big. Like democracy is at stake, or people are really suffering in very tragic ways. Well, I ways. would say you want to think about which things, which which sufferings most move you. There are many kinds of suffering, and we respect and acknowledge them. But some hit us much more than others. You know, and the same way again that, um, you know, that, that a painting or a poem, one artist will, you know, knock your socks off, another just as good won't. I feel it's the same with, you know, with social and political issues. What, what just grabs your heart? Mm -hmm. You know, find, um, find um, an organization, um, you know, a group that is sp focusing on something. It could be so particular, so specific. You know, but yeah. if it moves you, yeah. um, you know, then you can put in the time volunteering or doing envelopes or, or you know, whatever. But that, it has to start with some kind of passion. I really think that. Right. Very particular passion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.